and welcome to the program in case you're just joining us you're just in time for the second interview and uh, this is where we talk about health and lifestyle every wednesday and of course this particular wednesday we are talking about childhood obesity something that has now been uh, considered a very important public health challenge that many countries today are actually focusing on, going by what the numbers are telling us. I was just looking at some numbers from the World Obesity Federation that was telling us that from 1975 to 2022, the numbers of those who are obese have actually more than tripled, especially when it comes to children. Um, in 1975, for example, one in every 100 child was obese. But if you look at what was happening in 2022, and even I believe that this is the very latest from the Federation, is that the numbers have since grown to 10 per 100 young people. And studies are showing that these numbers keep rising. Like I've been having a conversation here with one of my panelists already, and we are looking at a future that if nothing is done, the numbers could just get worse and we may just lose this generation. And that is what we want to talk about, this growing crisis of obesity among children. Break it down and get to look at what you and I need to do and also what the policymakers and even the government can be able to do to save uh, the lives of our young people. And I'm joined for this very important conversation with a panel of two ladies. I'll just introduce uh, from the far right, Dr. Anjum Omar. Uh, she's a pediatric endocrinologist. Karibu sana to the program. And we also have with us Karo Moguero. Karo is a physiotherapist. And Karibu sana. Thank you for having me. All right. It's interesting to have you because we'll also be looking at the role of physiotherapy in managing, um, you know, obesity generally. And even just our focus this morning is on children. But let me just begin with you, Karo. Today we're talking about children. If you were to discuss describe obesity in the simplest term, like you're explaining it to a five-year-old because you're talking about children. What would you say obesity is? I would say obesity is, uh, in kids, it's accumulation of excess fat. Mm -hmm. uh, and mostly it's usually around the abdominal area. And uh, I, I wouldn't say like big, we have big bodies, big bodied babies, we we'll call them obese or overweight. Mm -hmm. Other factors that we consider age, height, and as well as uh, genetics, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, yeah. genetics. So she's gone even into some of the uh, courses, but I'd like uh, you, Dr. Tari, to also weigh in on this because there's usually that challenge of um, depicting whether this is just a chubby child. You know, parents love children who are looking chubby, who are healthy, or there's something that is wrong. So from your perspective, what would you describe as this is normal and this is actually a case of obesity in, in a child? Okay. When a child comes to the clinic, we always take the, the height and the weight of that child. So we actually calculate the BMI. Mm -hmm. BMI is called the body mass index. And then we plot it on the, on the graph. If the BMI is above 85 centile, then the child is overweight. If it's above the 95th centile, it's the child is obese. Mm -hmm. So that will tell us whether the, the, the child has, uh, has fat, accumulation of fat, or it's just the muscles. Because obese is, as she mentioned, accumulation of fat. So the BMI actually measures your fat. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And probably it would be interesting uh, because of even what you were mentioning earlier uh, to put this conversation into context. It's a bit concerning if you look at where the world is going when it comes to obesity and especially how it's affecting children. I'd, want, I'd like to hear your concerns about what you're picking from the trends, um, you know, of looking at how obesity is affecting children. Let me start with you, Dr. And also I'll get your thoughts, Carol, on this. Okay, right now we, get, we are getting a lot of consults for obesity, unlike before. And I think there's a lot of awareness now that uh, parents are now actually concerned about their child mm -hmm. who is obese. Because I think they face, they face a lot of stigma. In school, they are left out, the, uh, the self-perception and self-image also is affected. Mm -hmm. So that's when now they bring these children to, to, the, to the doctor. Mm -hmm. But by the time it's a bit late, like they bring it like when the child is 12, 13, 14 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
All right. And you, Karo, why, why do you think we should actually have a sit down and have this conversation if you look at what is happening, um, you know, around the world and even among our young people when it comes to this subject of obesity? Um, one of the factors that uh, brings about obesity is physical inactivity. And right now the child of today is the child who doesn't play anymore. A bus doesn't walk to school. And this predisposes them to obesity. And I feel it's important for us to address it. Now we have numbers. And especially when they come to the clinic uh, as a result of uh, other, the consequences of obesity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What you're saying is, and, and, and I'm getting it very clearly from both of you, is that by the time they are coming to even seek help, some of these cases are already, um, you know, too too late. Like, yeah. sort of like they still that laxity of even focusing on it until the very, um, it's it's too late uh, for this this problem to be managed. But that is why we are here, just to create awareness, especially among parents, because we are talking about a population that pretty much would say are not really responsible over their own lives um, like a hundred percent. So let's talk to both the children and, and the parents on how best to, to manage obesity. And at this point, maybe it would be important to look at some of the causes of obesity. She has touched on uh, the lack of uh, physical activity. Right now we are living in a world where because of security reasons or lack of space to play, many parents are raising their children within the folds of their homes. But then again, what are some of the general causes, I'll come to you, Daktari, of obesity, especially among children? Okay, uh, unhealthy diet, that's the first thing. You know, us now, parents, both the parents who are working and there's no time to cook food in the house. So most of them, they just go buy ready-made food. And that food is actually unhealthy food, which contains a lot of carbohydrate. And that carbohydrate is actually stored as fat. And because as you mentioned, there is no physical activity to burn that. Mm -hmm. And if these children are genetic, genetically predisposed, like their parents are obese, the children tend to get obese. So really need, so 90% of the cause is actually uh, exogenous, meaning from outside, mm -hmm. the unhealthy eating. Mm -hmm. And it's only 10%, which is now endocrine, like hypothyroid, Cushing's, or uh, growth, growth hormone deficiency. Uh, yeah, so those are the, and uh, genetics mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. We call it monogenic obesity. So those are the cause, 10% of causes of obesity. Mm -hmm. But 90% is exogenous mm -hmm. yeah so, so the, unhealthy. the weight of this problem is from external factors external factors. so that means there is there is hope right yeah there is. <laughs> because if only 10 percent is uh, from within yeah. then the 90 percent that means there's something that can be done about it if you talk yeah. about nutrition if you talk about physical activity these are things that actually can be influenced but i'd like to hear from you caro like when you look at a child what's like the right balance when it comes to what you mentioned, physical activity. How ideally, if things were to happen the way they are supposed to, how should the child you know, be engaged or be involved in some of these activities and what is the likely impact that this will have in the general growth of a child? Um, I will start to say, let us allow kids to be kids. Mm -hmm. Let kids play outside. Let kids go for a walk outside. And uh, I would say, like, for no more development to happen, kids have to have physical activity that is movement. Uh, as compared to what we have now, kids are sitting more rather instead of moving more. So I would like us to move more and sit less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What if there could be a parent watching and they would like to do that, but they feel like the environment they are living in is restricting them from doing that? What are some of the creative or innovative things that they can begin now to incorporate in their daily routine that can actually go a long way in helping introduce the physical movements and activities in the lives of their children? Oh. And we have to be realistic yeah, yeah. in the times and the environments that, that we live in, especially in urban areas today. Yeah, with the urbanization, you find uh, we don't have playgrounds mm -hmm. and kids spend most of the time in their house. So we can start by including them in maybe preparing food, they move around. 
our house chores, even if they won't do it perfectly, at least they'll move. And also have games like dancing in the house, yeah, puzzles, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as well as include like hide, hide and seek in the house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also I'll touch on the kids um, that are immobile. We can involve them in activities that uh, make them do whatever they can do, uh, despite their limitations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. These are children with special needs, special conditions yeah, yeah. that probably don't get the privilege to play like other children. Yes. They also have that. Uh, there's need for parents and caregivers to also involve some level of physical movement and activity. Yeah. Yeah. And also to add all these physical activities. Uh, it's better to include them in relation to what the child is interested in. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Dr. Ali, you talked about, um, and this has been a concern about the genetics and things that would happen that you, you would not have control over that would cause obesity. I want us to explore that a little bit before we get into the 90% that we can deal with and how to deal with. Let's talk about this 10%. Um, just to explain to us the depth of it, what are some of the causes that, 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 that fall within this 10% and how do they affect a child's um, you know, development? Okay, so the 10%, like some of them are, as I mentioned, hypothyroid, and actually when the child starts uh, uh, gaining weight and there are other signs as well like lethargy and the child is not, is not very active, uh, uh, the child's appetite despite the child eating less, child is gaining weight mm -hmm. and child is like feeling lazy. So that child needs to be done, investigated for uh, hypothyroid. In fact, all obese children, the first investigation we do is for thyroid. Does this child have hypothyroid? We need to rule out that. And then there are certain, then the other one is Cushing's. So there are other features for Cushing, Cushing's, uh, uh, apart from the fat. How is the face? How are there, are, are there other signs of Cushing's? The same thing, because these are all hormonal. And then, uh, then there is the growth hormone deficiency. We, these children with the growth hormone deficiency are actually short, very short, but they are obese and there is a lot of fat around the abdomen. So once we do the height and the weight, if the height is low and the, the height is low and the weight is high and the BMI is actually high, so this child is obese, but the height is low, the child is short. Mm -hmm then we actually uh, investigate them for growth hormone deficiency. Mm -hmm. So once we have for those three conditions, once we know the conditions, then we can treat these treatment. Mm -hmm. So once you start treatment, the obesity goes away. Okay, it's not external. And then there is the monogenic obesity and the syndromes. There are certain syndromes whereby the brain is affected. So there is no satiety. There's a problem with the satiety hormone. So you, the child does not feel full. So the child continues eating and eating and oh, eating. Okay. Yeah, because there's no signal from the brain to stop. Like once you, if you finish eating, your, your stomach is full. That means your brain has sent a signal through a certain hormone called leptin, saying the, the stomach, okay, you are full, stop eating. So you stop eating. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that uh, stimulation is not there in certain children who have mm -hmm. some syndromes or who have monogenic obesity, mm -hmm. and that is uh, genetic obesity. So they continue eating and eating and eating. So, and that is a very difficult mm -hmm. situation. Like, so what we tell the mothers, th those are the now times we tell the mother to lock the kitchen, to lock the <laughs> fridge. <laughs> And but mothers would be happy if their kids are eating, actually, considering the struggles of a child who is not eating. Yes. So, if so actually, that is the other thing. So, like when <laughs> when a child comes to me, the child is th okay. Till three years, we are not very concerned because that child's brain needs to develop. And then after three years, now we tell the mother that this child look take care of the child because this child is gaining weight, is going to be obese, mm. and for them, obese is healthy. Because yeah, a child they are is chubby, they are look chubby. healthy. Yes. yes, for them, malnutrition <laughs> yeah, is a disease. Yeah. But 
but you need to actually explain to them that this is the extreme end of the the problem mm -hmm. there's one extreme end of malnutrition the other extreme end is obesity mm -hmm. yeah so you need to explain to them why this is not a healthy child and why this child has a problem and they don't come at 15 or 16 years of of age but they come early enough because when you uh, identify the problem as early as four, three to four years it can be solved mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if you delay then the the body starts getting adapted to that situation mm -hmm. and it's it will be very hard for you to control the weight mm -hmm. so the earlier the better mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, it, so it's true then that, that, that what studies suggest that children who have obesity, there is a likelihood that there is a percentage of those that will carry this complication into adulthood. Adult, yes. Yeah? Yeah. All right. But at, at least you're telling us that if, if somebody is coming early, then something can be done. Yeah. We are just about to get to that. But let's talk about um, this, this, this condition that many are calling a gateway because it is linking to other, several other conditions. I'll come to the health side, but let me begin with the physical side. What are some of the impacts of obesity in the physical context? Like if a child is obese physically, what are the other things that they are likely to suffer from that are not necessarily obesity, but they come as a result of obesity? Okay, we can start with self-esteem. Um, you will find this kid is compared to other other kids, mm -hmm. and uh, and they are a bit bigger than their peers. So uh, you find a kid is being told you're bigger than your peer. So it might affect their self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Or you find a child uh, fatigues easily during activity. So you find this child shies off from playing with their peers. Mm -hmm. Uh, you find this kid doesn't uh, fit into the kid's appropriate clothes. You find maybe you're shopping at the kid's section, you can't find their sizes. Mm -hmm. You'll go to the, to the upper section. Mm -hmm. uh, another effect, uh, we have uh, studies have linked um, obesity to poor academic performance, mm -hmm. yeah, as well as general quality of life. Uh, and as Dr. I has said, uh, most, most of these obesity-related uh, um, complications are likely to be transferred to adulthood, uh, linking to increased um, maybe risk in hypertension, mm -hmm. orthopedic conditions such as low back pain, joint pain, mm -hmm. scoliosis, mm -hmm. blunt disease, mm -hmm. name them all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. You can imagine the hassle of shopping for your child and you have to go to the adult section just to get something that fits them, you know, that's, that's something for parents and caregivers there. But Dr. I know you have a lot also just that you can add, you know, conditions that come as a result of obesity. Um, just, just run us through some of those. Yeah. One mostly is uh, apnea, like when they can't sleep well. Every they wake up every like half uh, at night, mm -hmm. every hour mm -hmm. two, they wake up, they can't sleep because of that obesity. They don't have the put, uh, proper sleeping position. And then the second thing, as she mentioned, is uh, we see now these children now, therefore they come with hypertension. Mm -hmm. So we have started seeing, uh, we call it metabolic syndrome. So they come with hypertension then they come with the high cholesterol levels, this lipidemia. When you check their cholesterol, is the cholesterol is quite high. Mm -hmm. And that is a risk of a cardiac, uh, uh, ischemic cardiac disease or uh, cardi myocardial infarction. So this, these children, when they uh, uh, go into uh, ad uh, adulthood, they can get uh, cardi myocardial infarction at an early age. And then the other things like, as she said, pains, you know, the knee pains, because all the weight mm. goes to the knees mm -hmm. and they can't even walking. You will see a obese, the way they walk, it's, it's difficult, you know, even walking is a challenge for them. And then the, the, the pain, the back pain, arthritis. So they are, um, they are at risk of getting arthritis as well. 
-hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. these are some of the complications. So it's morbidity, you know, like the they 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 can actually if all this starts affecting their health, they actually die at an early age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then some of them they are also going to suicidal because they don't see they don't enjoy life. Mm -hmm. You know, for us we go out, we play. Them they because of that body image, they're always being stared upon mm, and the stigma, the stigma. So mm. the suicidal depression is very high in, in that society. Mm. And then even suicidal rate is high. Mm. Yeah. Like in that case, what should happen? Um, and both of you can, can share with us on this. I mean, in cases where you find because of obesity, a child is facing a lot of stigma and they are withdrawn and they are not living their life to the fullest like other children. What can be done even with parents and the, what to, just sort of to, to support this child because that, that, that is a big problem, yeah? Any of you can, can just give us ideas on how to help a child who is, uh, you know, dealing with obesity, yeah? Okay, we can start with the parent first. Uh, if the parent understands the, the importance of not stigmatizing this kid, uh, you'll find some parents, uh, they fear seeking help because their society will, will say they have, uh, sorry, to, uh, let me use a fat kid. Mm -hmm. So uh, it starts with uh, their parent accepting the condition of the, their child. If they accept kids, kids have low understanding of what they are going through or their behavior in terms of obesity. So if their parents understand, it's easier for us to navigate and help this kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and as a physio, when uh, I assess um, such a case, uh, we'll look at the body structure, physical activity levels of this child, uh, the mental status. And I feel in such a case, it's a multidisciplinary approach. I'll work with the consultant pediatrician, mm -hmm dietitian, physiotherapist, and also the parent as the main stakeholders in the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, usually, Dr. Ari, um, many people think that obesity is, is a, a, an individual responsibility kind of a condition uh, because of the failures in the lifestyle that you guys live. It's because of that that has caused this. But is it that black and white. You know, for us to get a, a solution to this problem, we have to understand the dynamics that cause it. Yeah. Is, is it right to blame it on the individual or, or the parent of that individual, that it's because of the things you eat, it's because of the life that you live, that's why probably the child is like that? Is, it, is that the right thinking? No, 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 that's not the right thing. Yeah. Actually, you know, you have to tackle it, and as she said, it is multidisciplinary. Yeah. Uh, that a multi multidisciplinary team should be involved in managing. So first, you you see parents always think that their child, if the child is big, it's a healthy child. So it's not their fault, but they need to be aware. So once the ch so the, when the child comes to the to the doctor for assessment, that the, the doctor needs to identify. As I said, the height and weight needs to be done, and a BMI needs to be calculated. And then that doctor, the primary doctor, because not all patients come to the endocrinologist. These are the patients who are referred to the endocrinologist when it's too late. So when they come to the, uh, to the primary doctor, physician or the primary doctor, to their primary doctor, and then the, when the primary doctor has identified that this child is now becoming obese, the weight is really increasing, increasing markedly they need to start identifying problem from their word go. Yeah, and then they need to try and talk to the parents, like look, this, 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 this. So they need to see what the problem is, the underlying problem, what the child's nutrition is, how the child is eating, how many times the child is eating, what the child is eating. And then this child needs, uh, then they need to go to the nutritionist. The nutritionist needs to give them a, a, a diet plan, a meal plan, which is ba basically a balanced diet, a healthy balanced diet. Mm -hmm. It consists of some percentage of proteins, percentage of uh, carbohydrate and vegetables. So they need to follow that. And then there's the exercise aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the we have physiotherapists, we have exercise physiologists as well who take uh, through these children for exercise. 
So exercise, there are many kinds of exercise like this, swimming, when the weather is good, they can swim. You know, if they're in coast, we have a whole ocean there. Mm -hmm. Here we have pools. And then if not, they can just run around, bike riding. There's a lot they can do, mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. Even in the house, they can do, as you mentioned, in, they can do the chores in the house mm -hmm. instead of just sitting on their gadgets because that, that, is a prob that is where the problem is. And that is where we blame the parents that do not give gadgets to your children throughout the day. You can give them, but time. Just one or two hours in a day, they can have that uh, screen time. Mm -hmm. After that, because there's a study which was done and the, the screen time was actually four to five hours. This was done in, uh, in Kenya, in mm -hmm. some schools in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And they found out that the screen time was actually four to five hours in a day. That is too much. Mm -hmm. Imagine a child comes from school at four o'clock till eight down. On TV, on or, TV on or on their sports. gadgets and at eight, even when they are eating, they are, still, yeah. they are still watching because that's what the mother said that otherwise this child will not eat. Mm. If, there's, if there is nothing for the child to watch, the child will not eat. Mm -hmm. So a lot. So they need to discipline the child on how to live healthy from the word go from when they are young. Because if they are disciplined from the word go, then at an, uh, when they grow up, it will be instilled in their brains that this is how I'm supposed to live. Every day, one hour, that's enough. And other hours, I need to do the one, two, three. I need to maybe go to the gym now when they're older, or I need to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting, you've talked about screen time. That's, that's really something. Um, there's, there's a question I also wanted just to take you back on, on the conditions and things that come because of obesity. How bad can it get? Can it lead to death? Um, I've seen some places saying there are some cancers that are related to obesity. It, it, can it get that, that, that yes, bad? Yes, it can mm -hmm. because there are certain cancers, especially hormone-related cancers, which come with obesity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And it can lead to death as well. It can lead to death, yeah. All right. So this is something that we need to talk about, especially when it comes to our young people. We're not just children. I believe obesity affects the entire population. And I, I want us to talk about now, um, I know you've touched on a few, uh, how to prevent, because usually we focus on treatment and investing on treatment, but then again, how to prevent. So far, do you feel there is something that you'd like, uh, Caro, to just sort of like emphasize on how best we can be able to prevent, you know, obesity, especially when it comes to children, anything that you feel we've left out? Oh, I feel um, kids learn from us adults, and we should be a good example to them. and. You, you, I cannot tell a child to run if I don't run. I cannot tell a child to eat healthy food, yet I've exposed them to fast foods. It starts with us, mm -hmm. so that you can you be lead passed, by example. We lead by example, yeah. So you can be passed down to, to the kids. If they see the mom is up and active, if you start dancing, the kid will start dancing too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, another thing is education, mass education of the importance of physical activity. Yeah. If people are educated enough of the importance of acti activity, it will help us know why we are advocating for ad obesity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Considering the, the, the um, limitations and the for lack of a better term, helplessness that parents have at home when it comes to physical engagement. What do you think schools can do to, to, to bridge the gap? I would say right now, most, most schools have focused on reading. Uh, they don't involve kids as before, as our time in play. Mm -hmm. So um, they can consult us, especially the physical education teachers, mm -hmm. so that we can come up with programs for healthier kids and those kids that are at risk of obesity as well as those kids who are obese and overweight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
All right. Yeah. There were days when PE was a very important subject and it was compulsory. I don't know whether it's still there these days where you just go and run and do all sorts of things in the field and then come back to class. I don't know whether that is still um, captured within the education system. But let's talk about treatment, Dr. Tari. Uh, first of all, the 10%, is it treatable? Yeah, the 10% the ten percent is treatable. Uh -huh. So once you make the diagnosis, you start the child on treatment. And then we follow the child, and actually the child gets back to normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, though it takes some time, but they go back to normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are treatable. All right. So let's now talk about the overall now, no. obesity in okay. children. What are the treatment options? And when we talk about treatment, yeah. what does this look like? How, how is it done so that we can be able to see whether in case somebody is watching and they have a child who is um, struggling with obesity, okay. what is it that they need to look out for? Okay, so the first stepping stone is lifestyle. They have to change the lifestyle. That is what we start with. Mm -hmm. Before any sort Before of... Before any sort, first yeah, we need to actually investigate home. the child. Mm -hmm. Does the child have any medical condition which is treatable? If the child does not have any medical condition, a very good history, that, uh, the, and the history consists of the, the food the child takes, the ex all that, like how much exercise does the child do, the screen time, all that is included in the history. And uh, so when now we have excluded the medical condition and now we have made the diagnosis of uh, this is uh, nutritional obesity. Now we start with lifestyle. So lifestyle is changing the diet. First of all, changing the diet and then exercise. So after that, like we, we, we uh, we follow them like for a month or two. If there is nothing, if there is no improvement in that, then we start them on medication. The, right now, uh, the FDA has approved uh, a medicine which actually reduces appetite mm -hmm. in children. Mm -hmm. and that is 12 years and above. Mm -hmm. And there are still trials in, in Western countries, in Europe, going on on now five years and above. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, uh, the FDA approval is for 12 years and above. So the, it, it's called GLP analogs. I think you must have heard mm -hmm. about GLP. Ozempic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. So these are actually the, how it works is it actually reduces appetite. It causes fullness. In the, in the stomach. Is in that uh, concerning for a child not wanting to eat? No, no, it actually, no. How does it work so, exactly? So you don't just give uh, the child the medication uh -huh. and just let go because that child also needs nutritional yes. Yes. advice. So that medication should be taken under the supervision of the doctor. Like the doctor needs to, because the dose are varying. And we need, we start with a very small dose under the supervision of the doctor, and then we send to the nutritionist. The nutritionist will give them an, a meal plan that they have to eat, because if the appetite goes down, then they'll not eat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what if they don't eat, and if the weight goes down very drastically, they can get very sick. Mm -hmm. So we don't want that. We don't want them to lose w weight uh, drastically, just slowly, like maybe a kg or two in a month, and then we achieve their uh, targeted weight, like in six months to a year. So we give them that prolonged period mm -hmm. to lose weight. Mm -hmm. We don't want them to, to lose weight in two months because that will now uh, give a rebound effect and they'll start gaining a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. So that has to be under supervision. We need to do some blood tests to see if there are any, uh, the, the, the causes, the side effects of the medication. And then even the nutritionist has to be mm -hmm. involved. So the, medi the medication is sort of like, it's just balancing the urge to eat. Yes. So it, and, and the need to eat. The need, yeah. So, <laughs> and so it you eat what has, you need, yeah? Yeah, it also has some side effects like vomiting, nausea. Mm. That's why they will not eat. Mm. Because if a child has nausea, the child will not eat food. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, 
And, and Carol, in your case, uh, so there is a case of uh, a child who has obesity. So where do you start as physiotherapists? What are you looking at? And how are you going about just incorporating them into some sort of uh, management process or treatment? Um, uh, first of all is uh, from the doctor's side, uh, the referrals are have the cause of the obesity, as well as myself are so it starts from the doctor to you guys? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Cool. It's a referral system. All right. Yeah. So if, um, if this uh, is related to physical inactivity, I'll come in there. And uh, my goal is to improve the frequency of physical activity and as well as quality of movement. Because you find some kids, uh, especially kids with special needs, they don't move as much as other kids. And maybe we say for a kid who has abnormal gait, in school she's not able to play like others, she's left behind. So she'll shy off to be physically active. Mm -hmm. So I'll come in to address such uh, the gait issues so that this child can be able to participate in physical activity. As well as we have kids uh, who have delayed mot motor function, such as walking, I'll come in there, help this kid to walk so that this child can be active. Mm -hmm. Inability to use a hand, maybe because of paralysis, I'll come in there to improve muscle power, muscle strength, so that this child can be able to achieve uh, physical activity levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have instances where, for instance, somebody has come and um, it's a, a severe case of obesity to the extent that even that slight physical movement, um, if they do it too much, it, it, it is not possible. And how do you work with such a person or, or such a child? Uh, Probably because the weight is too much, they are breathing heavily, if they do so much. How do you make sure that you deal with these very complex and unique cases? Uh, uh, say, for example, I had a patient, uh, she's 16, she, uh, she's obese, she had low back pain. So even slightly moving could cause pain, even sitting in school. Mm -hmm. So we start addressing the pain first. So that after the pain is gone, now we can go now to the, we create goals to lose weight gradually mm -hmm. and increase the physical activity. And, and I'll tailor a program which is not tailored on, based on weight loss, but physical activity. Because uh, if we, focus on weight loss, you'll find this kid will even starve themselves, do extreme, go to the extreme mm -hmm. of doing activity so that they can lose weight. So I'm there to supervise step by step so that we can achieve this, including it's a multi multidisciplinary approach. I can't do it alone. We have to have the child understand why we are doing this, their parent, and also the community at large, the people they stay with at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, to achieve uh, the outcomes, the desired out outcomes, yeah. there has to be that yeah. collaborative effort. Yeah, yeah, and also we have to include the child interest, mm -hmm. yeah, so that we can, we can achieve. Because if you try and do something that a child doesn't like, they won't do it, they won't follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And also, Dr. Ari, let's talk about the state of mental health. You know, when it comes to weight, people rarely think about mental health mm. as a factor, you know, that contributes to weight. I want you to talk to us about the correlation, how our mental health relates to our weight, weight okay. gain, or yeah. especially weight gain, because now today we are talking about obesity. Obesity, yes. So actually, obesity can cause depression. So if the child goes into depression, you know, it's because of the stigma, they are left out, they are not included in the society. So, so that starts, the child starts getting depressed that something is wrong with me. Maybe the child does not know that the child is obese, that's why. And the child is being mocked mm -hmm. and they laugh at the child because the child cannot take part in many activities. And as she mentioned about the gait effect, maybe the child is walking and falling and all that. So these children, they, they start going into depression. So that depression now, what they do is they don't want to go to school. They just want to sit and eat now because, you know, the 
when you get depressed, you actually are, you are confined. You are not very open. And then that now, start you, that now causes you to indulge in eating, more eating. And that uh, then causes more obesity. Mm. So actually you have to handle the obesity to remove the, the, the depression. Mm. So if you identify a child who is now going into depression or who has gone into depression, then you need to involve a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but a child psychologist is very important because they are the ones who, because these children do not need medication for depression. Mm -hmm. yeah. They just need to be talked to, yeah, so that they come out of that depression. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Actually, the, the, the depression could be as a result of obesity yes. and the stigma. Plus, the depression can actually even cause obesity. Cause obesity. It could start, from, yeah, this is how complicated this condition is, yeah? It could start from depression, yeah. then you start that, that soothe eating, yeah. emotional eating, just to soothe yourself, to yeah. feel good, and then you end up gaining a lot of weight because of eating as a result of dealing with whatever mental issues you're going through, then you become obese. obese. Or it could be the other way. Other way. So it depends on, uh, you know, where it's coming from. All in all, we are saying your state of mental health is very important. Look at it like wholesomely, 360, where could it be coming from? The same way we are saying it is linked to different conditions, this obesity, it is also caused by uh, an, an interlinkage of so many causes. So you need to think about this thing in a 360 sort of way for you to get the exact uh, solution. I want us to talk about what we need to do then to, to make a difference because it is a growing crisis um, that if nothing is done, you know, things could just blow out of proportion for our young people, beginning from homes to, to even schools, to even what policymakers need to do. Um, let's look at, first of all, um, in, the, in, the, in the home environment. I believe that we have touched a bit about. Let's talk about um, in as much as we are trying to control what our kids are eating, Hey, there are some flashy adverts of very, <laughs> you know, <laughs> mouth-watering snacks and, and foods that are out there that would, would, would just come in our way of trying to make our kids eat healthy. Do you think there's a way, you know, something can be done to also help in that aspect? Let me begin with you, Carol. Uh, I would say, uh, first of all, maybe uh, you'll find uh, one of the reasons why people have a poor, poor diet, it's the availability of healthy foods. You find uh, chips and fries, sausages are already available as compared to vegetables and fruits and legumes. So uh, maybe, maybe our marketers start marketing more healthier foods for us and they're more mm -hmm. beneficial to us. What if they are marketing what we demand? <laughs> They're going where the money is. That, that, that's why we, we need to educate <laughs> ours. Yeah. The importance of why are we telling you to take whole grain foods instead of processed food? That you have the health benefits. Yeah. And if you eat, you continue. Uh, fast food is, uh, isn't bad, but in excess. Yeah. So if we try to understand and educate people about the importance of good nutrition. I'm sure even the market will shift their focus from unhealthy foods to more healthier foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ari, you, your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, okay. Children, you know, when they see those billboards of KFC and all that, mm. they really get, you know, excited. So it's not a problem once in a, once in a while, like, you know, once in a week or once in two weeks. The parents can say, okay, you do this, and then we'll give you, uh, uh, what do you call? It might be a, a reward. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you do this exercise, you eat healthy, and then we'll give you a reward by taking you out, you know? Because all of us, even myself, once in a while, you know, it's not that we cut them off completely, mm -hmm. but there has to be a limit. And there has to be a limit, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so th th that's what I say, not all the time, like the, the parents need to actually cook that food, that healthy food. So even if there is potatoes, 
no problem. That potato can incorporate some vegetables in it, incorporate some legumes in it, so to make it healthy. So the child will see the potato, but will also see the the, the vegetables around mm, it. Mm. Yeah. Right. So maybe a child just writes, likes rice, but that rice, with the rice, they, they they can make those noodles with some vegetables, and they look very interesting. Mm -hmm. You know. And then maybe they can even show, like they are, nowadays there are very many videos whereby the children eat healthy food and mm -hmm. so they can even show that and how healthy they can become. So, mm -hmm. you know, these kids, they actually take what is given to them. They are not like teenagers, but these are children. So if, that's why I said, in, in fact, we have to start from preconception when the, when the mother conceives. Mm -hmm. That's when we start with the diet, healthy diet till the child is now two years. So if the child is two years and you are giving healthy diet, that child, even at 10 years, will not eat the junk. Yeah. We'll always eat healthy. Yeah. yeah. All right. As we just some, want to sample a few of your views, um, you have been uh, talking on social media as well, just uh, to tell us what you think about uh, childhood obesity. That, that's, that has been our focus uh, this particular morning. And of course, uh, you know, like it's coming out. I mean, I like the idea of being creative even with the screen time uh, to incorporate your goal as a parent, showing the children videos that can actually inspire them to yeah. live healthier lives, show them other children eating veggies and all that. Um, and they can actually uh, want to do that as well so that they can become strong and healthy. I want us to hear what our viewers are saying online so just so we can also uh, just uh, add your thoughts on this conversation and uh, this is what you're saying what of a kid what of what if a kid is consuming organic food and uh, is obese is it still unhealthy all right that's that's a question how can you control baby from gaining more weight while taking only breast milk okay I am Lillian from Kapsabet. I have a child four months old and the doctor says he is obese and I'm doing exclusive breastfeeding. What should I do to reduce the weight? All right, from Nakuru Paulin, you're saying, have a grandson, five months old, current weight 10.6 kg. The birth weight was 3.6 uh, kg, no winning, only breast milk. Okay, okay, okay. All right, Dr. Ari, this, this question. Um, yeah, so I, we face a lot of this. Yeah. So first of all, if a child is exclusively breastfeeding mm -hmm. and the child is gaining weight moderately, I would not worry. There is nothing like, we don't have diet for a child who is less than two, two years. If they are exclusively breastfeeding and now we have started weaning, there is no diet for that, especially the breastfeeding child. You don't... You don't uh, deprive them of milk because mm. they will just cry. But then if the child is, is, the child is gaining weight very markedly, not according to how they are supposed to gain, mm -hmm. they, need to be, uh, they need to be now screened for other diseases like, as I said, hypothyroid. Hypothyroid can cause that. So a child who is gaining weight, especially a baby who is gaining weight, you need to look for some underlying conditions. Mm -hmm. like but there's no problem with the breast milk? No, no, no. There's yeah? no problem because with the, the breast milk. The mothers there are concerned that I'm only breastfeeding the child, nothing else. So no, no, why no, are they no, gaining is, weight? I'm told they're obese. No, there's no problem with it the breast milk. It could be something milk. else. It could be something else. All right. That, 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 that is the same for the organic uh, food. There was a, one viewer who was saying the child only eats organic food, but they are gaining weight. Now they are told the child is obese. What, what could be the problem? Maybe there is an underlying condition. Mm -hmm as well as maybe the kid may be physically inactive. Mm -hmm. So obesity comes in when there is no balance between the energy intake and the energy mm -hmm. con uh, ex ex um, using the energy is, that, using that the, energy. the body generates. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so yeah. if the child is active and is eating, so mm -hmm. ensure like uh, there is a balance between what the child takes and the energy the child uses. Mm. Yeah. 
All right, thank you so much, ladies, for creating time for this very important conversation. Of course, it's something that we should be picking up uh, just to create more awareness on what parents can be able to do, caregivers, and even uh, what the whole community, like it's coming out from this conversation, it's, it's, it's not a problem that can be solved by one person. We all need the entire community to play a role in helping uh, us raise healthier children in this modern day and age. I've been engaging Dr. and Jum Omar, a pediatric endocrinologist, and also Caro Moguero, a physiotherapist. We really appreciate your time, ladies, once again. And thank you for watching Health and Lifestyle this particular Wednesday. My name is Safina Chengoma. Have a lovely day ahead and keep watching Citizen TV.